Thank you very much, um, Professor Brian O'Connell. I want to greet immediately Duncan Hindle, thank Professor Keats for this initiative, and must say that when I look at the list of people who will speak to you, Professor Lessig, Heather Ford, Jimmy Wales, and a range of other people, I feel a bit like Snow White in the story of the big bad wolf and the three little pigs. Where the big bad wolf had devoured the three little pigs that were now sharpening his teeth for Snow White, he ran up to her. And as he was about to eat her, she told him, if of, I'm not even in the story. <laughs> so, I don't know <laughs> exactly what I'm doing here. I'm not even in the story. But you know, I think that the reason that I decided to, if I'm not even in the story, to at least get into the book, is because I think that we must support the University of the Western Cape in its desire to define freedom beyond the traditional terms, beyond the known political terms, and to begin to understand freedom in the context of the information revolution that we are privileged or otherwise to live through. I think that if anyone can begin to understand both the opportunities and the drawbacks of this information revolution, then it should come from this intellectual base called the University of the Western Cape. If anyone can be able to grasp the power of ICTs and how to harness its positivity, not only for our country but for our continent, and to use it to stop the further marginalization of Africa, then it has to come out of the University of the Western Cape and its connection with other African institutions and universities. And so my role here is largely an affirming one, an encouraging one, and to be able to say that as Premier of the Western Cape, I'm proud that a university that had been in the vanguard of political struggle is in the vanguard of digital struggle and defining freedom as meaning greater access, greater affordability, and greater use of ICTs as we go forward. A few years ago, we were privileged that someone like Manuel Castells was the guest of President Mbeki. And we thought that we would engage him on the highfalutin stuff of this digital revolution. And he said, and all of us were in a sense sitting at his feet, saying, Manuel Castells, how are we going to make sure that Africa is part of this digital revolution, that we overcome the digital divide, and that we harness ICTs for Africa claiming its space and claiming this century as the African century. His response was embarrassingly basic. He said to us, if Africa wants to enter the digital revolution, then you've got to recognize that across the entire continent of Africa, there are as many phones as there are in the city of New York, and there are as many telephone connections as there are in the city of Tokyo. You must recognize that the digital revolution, the ICT revolution, needs that kind of connectivity. And if you want a reliable connectivity through telephones, through telephony, then you must recognize that you need a reliable electricity grid across the entire Africa, because that's what drives telephones. And if you want a reliable electricity grid across the entire Africa, then you are going to have to understand that the biggest inhibitor of electricity grids and its expansion is the absence of peace. Because the first thing that rebels do is that they destroy electricity pylons because they know that that carries 
within it the buzz of progress. So if you want to be part of the digital revolution and you want to move Africa from the margins to the center of the world, make peace. Build democracy. Establish freedom. And it's in that combination that you will be able to start entering Africa into the digital revolution. As I said, it was embarrassingly simple, and I think that there are still many people who wonder why we are sending half of the cabinet to make peace across Africa. Why we are feverish about creating South Africa as a base for electricity, the generation of power. Why we are sending troops to secure Kahora Basa and to think about harnessing the Zaire River or the Congo River's power to build that electricity grid. So the point is that we've got to discuss this at all levels of society. We've understood, and I'm putting it in very lay terms, that there are probably three concentric circles for our insertion into this digital revolution. At the inner circle, it is that institutions, and particularly government, has to harness ICTs to re-engineer itself. That you cannot advocate ICTs for society if government does not allow and if institutions do not allow themselves to be reshaped by the power of ICTs. It's got to lead to greater innovation. It's got to lead to creativity. It's got to lead to new ways of thinking, of reorganizing bureaucracies, of creating better efficiencies within the way in which we work, shortening lead times, turnaround times, decision-making times, because that begins to say that at its core, institutions and governments are allowing themselves to be re-engineered, that innovation and business processes must be transformed. The second concentric circle is at the level then, having established ICTs at the heart of government and its business processes, is to create the e-governance capacity so that govern, government and its citizens can begin to speak to each other electronically, to begin to transact with each other, whether it's procurement, whether it's information, or whatever the case may be. It is that government and its citizens, that government allows its citizens to be empowered and does not fear an empowered citizenry, establishes as we have in the Western Cape, Kanya Laboratories, at this point at almost every school in the Western Cape, and allows young learners to be empowered and educated and informed through that and to become literate in it, to enable other processes that government knows it cannot control, but to enable those processes to go ahead and to proliferate. So the point is that if at a very pragmatic level, if government wants to pay more attention to its poorer citizens who are in a sense disconnected, then it must allow its enabled citizens to use the power of ICT and e-governance particularly to be able to transact, to pay their rent, to pay their rates, to pay everything electronically so that we use our human resources and concentrate them on the areas which are disconnected. And I think that that becomes absolutely critical in a model of e-governance. And then the third concentric circle, the outer circle, is to create the basis of a knowledge-based economy, to be able to harness ICTs to transform society, to provide skills, and to be able to compete with the Chinas, to use design through ICTs in order not to compete with China to make the same sweaters, but to get into niche markets, etc., etc., to be able um, to transform it and to use ICTs for the development of society. And so I think that those become absolutely critical, and it shows us the importance of utilizing digital technology and ICTs also to further the ideals of democracy. It's going to be a tough democracy because it's not based on regular voting. It's based on allowing a kind of dissidence to take place, a spread of information, 
that may or may not be comfortable um, for government, but to allow it. Because if you use Caldo's definition of democracy, of e-democracy, he says that democracy is a government in which the supreme power is vested in the people and exercised by them directly or indirectly through a system of representation. That's democracy. Putting an E in front of democracy means nothing more than using information technology tools to facilitate, improve, and ultimately extend the exercise of democracy. And that, I think, is the boldness that we in government are challenged with how do we move from what we understood and fought for as democracy? How do we embrace e-democracy with all the dissidents, with all the opportunity, and with all the challenges that would go with it? Freedom and democracy, however, needs equity. So how, how do we, within this digital revolution, also ensure equity? One way is access by getting out into every library, ICT, getting into every school, the Kanya College, creating the portals, the gateways, etc., etc. I think that what will be debated here is free and open source um, software, the low cost and the benefits associated with it, so that its own democracy takes place, how it is shared, how software is shared, etc., etc. And I think that that becomes absolutely critical as we go on. The, but in this democracy, we've understood what the Aspen Institute defines as net politic, not just simply real politic, but net politic. It's the exploitation of powerful internet capabilities to shape politics, culture, values, personal identity, and public perception. It's contested, because everyone can, but for as long as there's inequity in the distribution of those resources, you may have skewed perceptions, cultures, and all of those things developing. I'm very surprised that um, I've taken the bold step in my State of the Province address to announce that I'm opening a blog. The 90% of those who speak to me, 90% of those who speak to me, speak to me about street names and the stadium, and most of them are white males. And it shows to me the fundamental inequity. And of course, I don't want to be stereotypical, but you can imagine what they say to me when they speak to me about those kind of issues, why they've chosen those issues, and what the opinions will be out of it. And that shows to me that we need UWC to open up those, 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 those fiber optic cables and to get them buzzing with a full range of opinion. Otherwise, the democracy benefits and, every, and the freedom benefits out of the digital revolution will be monopolized by a few. And that's why I think we're here to save my blog. Um, <laughs> but on the other hand, if we get it right, government can harness what is called not hard power, but soft power. How a government uses persuasion, public information, education, communication, culture, trade, aid, investment, and marketing to secure public support of its interest, or at least public understanding of its interest, its values, and its policies. And that, I think, would be the benefits if access and affordability and sharing of software and so forth would be facilitated. I want to say that, in a sense, every cloud has a silver lining, um, every opportunity has a drawback. And again, I think that we look to UWC to look both at the enormous positive values of the digital revolution, but to also intellectually engage on what I would call the challenges or the drawbacks of it. Every different revolution or epoch has both its enormous positive values, but also its drawbacks that need to be guarded against. And maybe it's just germane to those transitions in, 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 in history. The agrarian revolution destroyed slavery, but brought about um, feudalism because it needed to reorganize around a new agrarian situation. The industrial revolution destroyed feudalism 
but created huge economic cleavages, huge cleavages between traditional living and urban living and urban squalor that went with that urban living. We need to begin to understand that this next revolution that we are living through, the information revolution, it makes people more mobile. It creates a skills base. It creates an information base that is unheard of. It gives power through education and information. It allows people to escape the traps of a class society, to become more class mobile in the way they go forward. It creates economic opportunities, but it also detribalizes. It also detraditionalizes. For faith communities, it questions every value that have been available for the last few centuries. And so, a lot of the things that's happening in society comes about because of the uncertainties that come with information being available, detribalizing, detraditionalizing, and, um, um, and, and, and dereligionizing, and shifting cultures and shifting identities at a rapid rate. It creates an enormous basis of uncertainty. And as J.K. Galbraith has said, the more uncertain people are, the more dogmatic they become. That's the breeding ground of your fundamentalisms. That's the breeding ground of your terrorisms. That's your breeding ground of the reaction. They're not reacting against Bush. They're not reacting against America. It is a reaction, ultimately, against the uncertainty wrought by this digital and information revolution. And so, while we embrace it, and while we move forward, we've also got to find solutions to the fundamentalisms. We've also got to continue defining what our values are. We've got to continue defining what it is that we stand for and what is good, so that we don't allow it to become so iconoclastic, destroying every icon in our society, that it rots entire communities, entire religious groups, that feel marginalized and feel the need to assert themselves with violence, with dogma, with fundamentalisms. And so I think that these are interesting challenges that we've got to be able to face up to. But if you expected a far more thoughtful speech from me, um, wait for Mr. Wales and Professor Lessig and all of those kind of people. I just thought that I'd troubleshoot a little bit and um, raise my expectations that UWC not only unleash the power of ICTs for all of us, but it also problematizes the unleashing of those ICTs because we need a thoughtful institution to remain thoughtful and to be able to look at the overall interests of our society as well. Thank you very much.